In 1493, the Duchy of Milan was ruled by Lodovico Sforza, the Moor. I regret that the very pressing necessity of having to earn my bread has forced mm. me to delay the commissioned work, Your Excellency. Yes, yes, get on with it. Knowing Your Excellency's circumstances, I hesitated writing. Mm. Since it has been two years, however, since I last received any wages... Mm. Two years? Well, it can't be, can it? Uh, shall I continue reading? Yes, go on. Of the horse, Your Excellency commissioned, I will not even speak, knowing what the times are like. Brava. Much better to say nothing. Much better. What do these people expect of me anyway? I've rebuilt the Duomo, I've rebuilt the Grazia. I've rebuilt hundreds of canals so you can row all the way from the Tessino to the Adda. And if anyone should know the money it cost me to build those canals, he's the one. Didn't he invent those new doors? No matter what it costs, they've got to open out instead of opening it. I've imported so damned many Chinese silkworms, a man can barely walk without sliding along the street. They know my finances are in, are in difficulty at the present. Oh, that plus worrying about the French. Get them both here tomorrow. Yes, Excellency. Uh, who, Excellency? The monk at the Grazia. The other letter writer. Leonardo. <coughs> Come on, how to cold, what's the difference? <coughs> <coughs> After you, Maestro. It doesn't hurt to be safe. You're a scientist. Think it'll help me? I wouldn't know, but it will help him because he'll be paid. <laughs> Why do all Tuscans have an evil tongue? Bill, go away. All right, come here. Now then, now then, the reason I have... <coughs> the main reason I sent for you, and this also includes you, this famous artist, I have decided, is going to decorate one of the refectory walls of your monastery. Something, most oh, something religious, of course. Last Supper, I think. Your refectory will have a fresco done by a famous painter. And you, you, maestro, We'll be able to eat again. I think you know the monks are wealthy. But we're not. Our treasury is... <laughs> if my treasury were as well stocked as yours is, I'd gladly pay. Oh, I would only ask you whether or not the painting necessarily has to be done in the refectory. Well, of course, the refectory. Where else? We eat there. So? I point out that Maestro Leonardo, who is a, a most excellent artist, he is, uh... uh... What you mean is he doesn't work very fast. Practice patience. While he's working, you can feed the monks in the kitchen. I'm not going to send you a man with a broom, you know, who'll push a lot of paint around, who'll finish a wall in a half an hour and leave a mess like that so-called mural of Montofano's. You've already got in the refectory. <coughs> and while you're there, I want you to have that eyesore rubbed off. Every time I go to the monastery to fast, it turns my stomach just to be in the same room with it. Your food's bad enough already. Might I say only... <coughs> you have my permission to leave. Deo gracias, that's all. <coughs> well, you've got a job now. Why don't you look happy? <coughs> Marquisino. Uh, strange. How whenever my treasurer walks in, it brings a smile to everyone's face. Painters and monks alike. Listen, pay a hundred ducats in advance to my friend here. Uh, Leonardo. Yes, yes, Leonardo. The Last Supper. The subject had naturally been dealt with on several occasions by other artists beginning with the monumental composition of Giotto in the Cappella Scovegni at Padua. Later by Andrea del Castagno in the church of Santa Apollonia in Florence. Castagno carried the theme further. He retained the idea of St. John reclining his head on the breast of Jesus but put all except one of the apostles on the same side of the table, facing the viewer. 
Francesco Botticini pursued basically the same path, with just one major exception. The table was no longer straight, but shaped as a horseshoe. Leonardo immediately began working on a series of sketches. This drawing, owned by the Venetian Academy, shows his initial concept, although more than likely it is not an original. It is probably a copy made by one of Leonardo's pupils. The copy does show, nevertheless, that Leonardo's first thoughts about the Last Supper were along traditional lines. But he was far from satisfied. Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Leaning on Jesus' bosom. Hmm. Jesus said, whither I go, ye cannot follow. These prophetic words isolated Christ in a world where no one could reach him. The embrace of death, which he knew was waiting, kept him isolated from his disciples and buried him in a long silence which he would break only much later with the words, go and love ye one another. From this moment on, the sketches of the Last Supper show a solitary Christ. Not even John, the beloved disciple, is near him. No longer does he recline his head on Christ's bosom as in the Gospel or in the paintings of Giotto and Andrea del Castagno. Alone in the midst of his disciples, Christ neither speaks nor accuses. He is absorbed in his own thoughts, removed from the turbulence around him, which he himself has caused with the words one of you shall betray me. More remote than the distant sky behind him, which grows dim with the last light of evening. Despite the many sketches, the extensive research, and the establishment of a principal theme, Leonardo, as usual, began further research and study. The scaffolding went up in the refectory of Santa Maria della Grazia. But except for the barest outlines, the huge wall remained empty. Take it you're not working today, Maestro Leonardo. Ah, but I am working, brother. Listen to what I've written down. One apostle who's been drinking puts his cup down to the left while another talks. He's whispering, actually, to the apostle on his right. While another apostle, who's just finished cutting a piece of bread, holds oh. a knife. Uh, most interesting, I'm sure, but I've never heard of a painting being written. Well, now you have. My paintings are written. Good day. It seems he's too busy writing to paint. But Leonardo was ready to paint. Vasari writes, When he saw a face that interested him, he would sometimes follow the man all day. If he found the face to his liking, he would burn its image into his brain, so that when he worked, 
it was as though the model was still there in front of him. When he was working, he would rise before dawn, climb the scaffolding, and paint from sunrise to sunset, the brush never leaving his hand. More often than not, he would forget to eat and drink. So wrote Matteo Bandello some years later, recalling Leonardo in the refectory of the Grazie. Salai. Patience, my brothers. He'll be finished very soon, I hope. I hope he's drier than me. Salai. Mix the blue. Yes, maestro. Salai. Yes, maestro. Ultramarine. Psst, boy. You want something to eat? Thank you. Go on, eat. Salai. Then he might do no work at all for two or three days, carefully examining the work he had done. Let's go in. No one's there. Look how big it is. It's the whole wall. Wonder how long it takes to finish a wall. What if somebody comes in? Don't worry, there's no one here. It's beautiful. Who's that with the beard? It's one of the apostles. I know that. Look at that. Which one is it? Maybe it's St. John. Wonder how long it took. Look at that one. That one's Judas. Look at that John. Judas looks just like the friar. You be quiet. He's right. Right. He does not. The prior's my uncle. Judas doesn't It still wasn't done. It'd be another year, actually. It occupied him five years start to end. Why is he wearing a hat? Shh. Many years later, when he had achieved fame as an author, Matteo Bandello wrote, He'd spend a good many mornings at Corte Vecchia. There he would work until midday on that colossal horse, the equestrian monument to the House of Sforza. And then at noon, he would go straight to the Grazie. On some days, he would take his brush, paint one or two strokes, and then suddenly leave. It was worth each day Leonardo put into it because every line, every stroke used in the painting is there for a very good reason. It looks effortless, and yet the minute you see it, you realize how brilliantly it was planned. Geometrically, everything converges on the face of Jesus to accentuate his solitude, alone even among his apostles. The apostles themselves are placed in groups of three. There are two great arcs in addition, which serve to connect the individual groupings to each other, one on either side. They're very much part of the master plan. The two dramatic poles of the composition are here. On the right, faith and purity, personified by Philip, higher than all the others. The apostle who had followed Christ from the very beginning. His reward was the highest place of all. On the other side, the apostle Judas, in the lowest place. A line drawn from the face of Judas to that of Philip runs exactly through the face of Christ. Abandoning the classical fresco, he developed a new method of his own. He applied a layer of gesso, a specific kind of plaster, to the wall. After letting that layer dry completely, he applied a second layer of plaster. And on top of that, he applied a sizing or imprimatura as he would have to a canvas or a panel. Then, after having prepared the wall, instead of oil paint, he used tempera, which is color pigment dissolved in the yolk of an egg. This new method allowed Leonardo to work on an immense wall using the same deliberate style and attention to detail he would have used on a small panel. But, unfortunately, the three layers Leonardo used, the gesso, plaster, and imprimatura, each dried somewhat differently. And they began to expand somewhat differently. On the day after the new year of 1497 had begun, the Moor's young wife paid a visit to the Grazie, Beatrice d'Este, obstinate, volatile, and cunning, despite her youth. During the brief span of their marriage, she had already managed to purge the court of her husband's advisors and favorites. Then she prevailed upon him to eliminate his nephew, whose power he held in trust, and proclaim himself duke. She was a power to be reckoned with in Milan. 
Truly, all the reports I've heard about your fresco are not exaggerated. Beatrice was ill and in pain, and her advanced pregnancy promised to be difficult. But she continued to carry on with her duties, because power must endlessly be consolidated or it slips away. We had better go. There is still much to do before the banquet this evening. But haven't you made a mistake? The Bible tells us John's head was reclined on the breast of our Lord to comfort him. You're right. But at that moment, no one could comfort him. <laughs> of course. He couldn't be comforted at all. Let us be on our way. It's late. Lorenzo. That evening during the festivities, Beatrice was suddenly taken ill. Find the physician! Hurry! Beatrice, Beatrice, what is it? Find the physician! Out of the way! In there, in there, on the bed! All right, let her down, I've got her. Beatrice, Beatrice, what is it? What's wrong? Get me that physician. The physician, oh, quickly! Tell what us what's happened. What's wrong? Is she all right? She's painted. I don't know what's happened. Perhaps a premature birth. What is it? Beatrice, do you hear me? What's wrong? Music. Huh? A song. What song? Don't stop. Dance for me. Ah, oh, I see. You want to hear music? Marquisino. Marquisino! Start the music. Music? Again? Yes, yes, music! Oh. Oh, Signore! Let us go on with the music. It is our young Duchess's wish. Music! Well, Beatrice, can you hear? You've got the music you want. Can you hear it now? At midnight, in the midst of the festivities, Beatrice died. by the wall. We'll take them out later. You heard him. Over by the wall. That's it. Just pile them up for now. Get this section here next. You do This section here. Careful. Careful, gentlemen. That scaffolding can be used again. Let's have some men over here. Easy or this thing will fall down. Salai, stop shouting. Come down here and Someone help. has to see it's done right. All together now. By February 1498, the painting was more or less complete and it was the object of great admiration. Stop right there. Unfortunately, it was to remain intact for only a few short years. <laughs> All right, let's get everything out of the way. The Duke is coming in a little while. He struts around like a peacock. Who put him in charge? Hurry up, we can't take all day. Salai was now 16. He had grown more handsome with the years, 
but still was as vain and presumptuous as ever. Uh, Marco, have somebody sweep out the place. Yes, yes. Hurry, the Duke will be here soon. Despite all of his faults, he managed to stay friends with his patron, Leonardo, who continued to chronicle everything. And his records, occasionally, would include notes like this one. Salai steals money. Are you with him? Yeah, you three finish sweeping up. The rest of you come with me. His masterpiece was still not completely finished, and already the three layers were beginning to crack. One might even think that fate, perhaps reinforcing an unconscious desire for self-destruction in Leonardo, was exerting its influence. Through accident, or through destiny perhaps, nearly everything the genius of Leonardo created suffered some catastrophe. Some were destroyed, partially or completely. Others have been lost, and some remain hidden, the numberless inventions hinted at in his writings, in obscure archives. And often his ideas were just ignored, or went unnoticed for centuries till mankind, without knowing it, rediscovered some of them. Nevertheless, during the few years in which it remained intact, the Last Supper was one of the wonders of the world. But only 50 years after it was finished, Vasari wrote, the painting is a confused blur, from the very beginning, misfortune seemed to follow Leonardo's masterpiece. In 1652, the monks removed a portion and put in a door. This was needed to speed service between the kitchen and the refectory. At last, we'll finally be able to have hot meals. The tide of history wrought its own special havoc on the painting. In the early 19th century, Napoleon's soldiers turned the refectory of the Grazia into a stable, despite orders to the contrary from Napoleon himself. In August 1943, the area surrounding the Grazia was heavily bombarded. Sandbags were used to protect the fresco, and almost miraculously, that wall and only that wall remained intact. But as the war went on, there wasn't much else done to save it. During war, more pressing things concern you. In 1946, after the refectory was rebuilt, careful and patient restoration was begun. But the Last Supper had been reduced to the state you see here. If we believe in signs, that first crack was an omen of the coming events. In the following year and a half, the world in which Leonardo lived was destroyed totally. For years, the local lords and squires had called on the French to fight in the petty rivalries that divided the tiny states of the Italian peninsula. But in 1499, the French came without being asked. Louis VII invaded the Duchy of Milan. During the night of September 2nd, Lodovico the Moor, knowing he had been defeated, went to pray at the tomb of his young wife, Beatrice d'Este, for the last time. flee Milan and the Grazia. The Grazia, which had been so dear to him. He had lavished gold and labor upon it, and had chosen it as the site of his own tomb. He had enriched the monastery with the most beautiful fresco the world had ever known. And now he had to leave it and everything else behind. The Grazia, Milan, the Duchy, all that he had gained through his astuteness and patience. He 
was to die in France, a prisoner at the age of 56. In little more than a month, the French took the city. Together with Salai and Luca Pacioli, Leonardo left Milan. With his usual cold accuracy, he wrote, The Duke has lost his state, his possessions, and his freedom. Several works I had begun for him were left incomplete. Before leaving, Leonardo fenced in a small vineyard which had been given to him by the Moor a few months before the French invasion. The vineyard, just outside Porto Lodovica, was part payment for projects the Duke had commissioned. It wasn't very large, less than two and a half acres, in fact. But Leonardo had a thousand plans for it. He was afraid the French would confiscate the property, knowing he had been in the service of the Duke. And indeed, his fears proved correct. So he turned his steps toward Mantua, where he would seek refuge with Isabella d'Este, Beatrice's sister. in the river is the last to go and the first to arrive. At the age of 50, Leonardo was forced to begin again. Behind him, years of sorrow and sacrifice. Works begun and left unfinished. Once again, he faced need and uncertainty. His departure from Florence on a warm spring morning 20 years before was a deliverance. But his departure from Milan on a cold December morning was a flight. Mantua was a tiny state ruled by Francesco Gonzaga. Its small but refined court was ruled by his wife, Isabella d'Este. Intelligent, cultured, and gregarious, Isabella was a patron of music, painting, and literature. She spent hours every day at her desk writing to the various artists whose work she was anxious to obtain, tirelessly pursuing another masterpiece to add to the ones she already possessed always ready to display her collection to the visiting princes and ambassadors. We live a simple life without much ceremony. If you'll excuse me, I'll tell my wife you're here. Isabella, the Venetian ambassadors would like to pay their respects before leaving. Oh, what a lovely surprise. You find me in my study amongst my friends. Your Excellency, we do not interrupt. Oh, no, no. Have I the honor of knowing your friends? Oh, yes. Perugino, oh. Montaigne. To me, they're very real friends. I would feel the same. Oh. Would you care to see some of my gallery? I would indeed. Ah. Oh. Very well. Uh, this way, Excellency. You'll excuse the informality of this tour. It's the way we live. Perhaps the beauty of all the paintings will excuse my poor etiquette. Oh, please, no excuses on this. Oh, that violet. My eyes are drawn to that violet robe every time I enter this room. I've always adored violet. Oh, and isn't this blue lovely? The Marchesa Lodovico and the Marchesa Barbara of Hohenzollern. Come in. Please, come in. This is exquisite, Your Excellency. Oh, Entertain them. Yes. At any other time, the arrival of an artist of Leonardo's stature would have made Isabella ecstatic. Show him in. But at that particular moment, Leonardo's presence could have proved dangerous. The French were the new rulers of Milan across the border. What would their reaction be if Mantua provided refuge for those who had fled Milan? No, no, don't interrupt your work. Cecilia, a friend of yours is here. Friend of mine. Cecilia Gallerani. For 10 years, the gentle mistress of the Moor and Leonardo's great friend at court. Along with so many others, she too had sought refuge with Isabella. Since she had no power or political ties, Cecilia was granted sanctuary. Isabella carefully weighed who would compromise her position and who would not. 
No, please rise, maestro. A prince of the art should be received as such. Now, come along. I think I have a rather nice surprise for you. Cecilia. La Contessa Bergamini. Dear Maestro, we're so very pleased that you were able to visit us while passing through Mantua. I cannot tell you how much. Ah, what times we're living in. One doesn't even have the privilege of guiding one's own destiny. Ah, I mustn't dwell on that. And you, Maestro, you're going to... to Venice, are you? Uh, yes, Venice. Oh, but one day soon you'll have to come back here. You must return to paint for us. Mantegna, Perugino. Without a Leonardo, my study will never be complete. Cecilia, do you recall the time I asked you to lend me Leonardo's portrait of you, even for only a day? Oh, if only you had time, Maestro Leonardo. Leonardo had probably hoped to stay in Mantua, but Isabella made it quite clear that he could not. Zoroastro, I'll uh, want to leave soon. Is everything packed? It's all ready, Maestro. Good morning, Zoroastro. I told the Marchese you wished to see her. This should please her. Ah, well, I see you made a copy. Hmm. I'll take it along. I might even do a painting from it. Zoroastro, get my easel. Yes, Maestro. Leonardo paid Isabella for her few days of hospitality by presenting her with a magnificent drawing, which now hangs in the Louvre. It's magnificent, Maestro. Oh. But imagine if it were a painting, a real painting, all filled with that magic light and shadow you bring. I wanted a sketch of Your Excellency first. I may do it in oil if it pleases you. Does that mean you have to take it with you? Oh, no. It's yours to keep for your kindness to me. My painting of you will be done using the true image I carry of you in here. I shall look forward to seeing it someday. And you will paint it for me. You promise that. You will promise. Would that you could stay with me. The painting was never done. Leonardo left Mantua and the insatiable Marchese. But as the years passed, Isabella never forgot the opportunity she had lost. Would that you could stay with me. The King of France in nearby Milan was considering an invasion of Mantua. With her tiny state in danger, Isabella met the situation in her own inimitable way. She journeyed to meet the king, smiling, bearing a painting by Mantegna and wearing a dress decorated with gold lilies, the French emblem. Mantua was left to rule itself. Leonardo left for Venice, where the Doge had recently suffered a heavy defeat at the hands of the Turks and feared a full invasion was coming. In Leonardo's notes, we find the following. Most noble gentlemen, having made some preliminary study of the military invasion which seems to be imminent, I've reached the following conclusion. The Turks' most probable invasion route is necessarily by way of the river Isonza. Did he make these recommendations in order to interest the Venetian Senate in his services, or was he already in their employ by that time? Since Venice could be chiefly attacked from the sea, it was there he developed an idea. We'll just leave it half in and half out of the water, and we'll raise it later on when we're ready. When we're ready. Raise it later on when we're ready. Yes, yes. Now for the other one. I'll have to find a boy, a good swimmer. A boy who can keep a secret. Yes, a secret, a secret. It will work. Attach the tube to the face the inflated skin, swim underwater, underwater, unseen. No one will see. You breathe through the tube. At the changing of the guards, it will explode and set fire to the galleys. <laughs> It will rise back up. A 
mask with eyes made of glass. Ah. You must have a knife, a sharp one, should it be caught in a net. These fragmented phrases, vague, ambiguous, and for centuries mystifying, are all to be found in Leonardo's notes. He had had a sudden vision of two new and fearful weapons he could offer Venice for its defense. A boat which could rise and sink, la submarine, and men who could swim and operate underwater, breathing through tubes, skin divers. He wrote, surrender in four hours or you will sink. You'll have your warning. Briefly, he considered leading an attack against the Turkish fleet, destroying it with submarines and divers. In secret, he began having the equipment made to his specifications. He would set fire to the first galley himself. And as the savior of Venice, he foresaw for himself rewards of eternal fame and immense wealth. Rich and powerful, he would then be free to devote time and energy to his studies. In order to make certain he would not be cheated of his rewards, however, after he had saved Venice, he wrote in his notes, First, obtain a promise. It must be put in writing that half the ransom for the prisoners will be yours with no exceptions. And, and the money received in payment deposited with Manetto. But his dream was fleeting. The emotions he had felt were soon replaced by other ones. Suddenly the boy was gone and the man was back in command. this decision knowing too well the nature of man I know my designs would be used badly murder so many men have seen these same visions of destruction but chose not to hold back unlike Leonardo the diving suit and the underwater vessel the brilliant creations of a fertile mind were both hidden hidden for four centuries till man was to discover them again Zoroastro Zoroastro Hey! <laughs> patience, patience. We'll never leave at this rate. Where's the maestro? In the square. I'd better get him. Maestro! Maestro! I'll be right there. Leonardo's stay in Venice was very brief, only a few months. But before leaving, he paused to see the equestrian monument his old teacher, Maestro Verrocchio, had designed. It must have brought back the years. He had seen it from its inception to the day it was dismantled and shipped for casting. And now it stood in the square of Venice, ready to challenge the centuries. And what of Leonardo's own great horse? Months of studying anatomy, hundreds of sketches, the initial plaster work begun. Its scarred remains now stood in the rain, falling to pieces. So many years gone. So much genius wasted. So many projects begun and left unfinished. But it was not too late. At the age of 50, many productive years lay ahead. No longer would he waste time studying and dreaming. 
There was so much to be done. He would go back to Florence where it all started. No more delays. Ready, Maestro? He would do something. Yes. beginning with the monumental composition of Giotto in the Cappella Scovegni at Padua. Later by Andrea del Castagno in the Church of Santa Apollonia in Florence. Castagno carried the theme further. He retained the idea of St. John reclining his head on the breast of Jesus but put all except one of the apostles on the same side of the table, facing the viewer. Francesco Botticini pursued basically the same path, with just one major exception. The table was no longer straight, but shaped as a horseshoe. Leonardo immediately began working on a series of sketches. This drawing, owned by the Venetian Academy, shows his initial concept, although more than likely it is not an original. It is probably a copy made by one of Leonardo's pupils. The copy does show, nevertheless, that Leonardo's first thoughts about the Last Supper were along traditional lines. But he was far from satisfied. Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Leaning on Jesus' bosom. Hmm. Jesus said, whither I go, ye cannot follow. These prophetic words isolated Christ in a world where no one could reach him. The embrace of death, which he knew was waiting, kept him isolated from his disciples and buried him in a long silence which he would break only much later with the words, go and love ye one another. From this moment on, the sky I've imported so damned many Chinese silkworms, a man can barely walk without sliding along the street. They know my finances are in, are in difficulty at the present. Oh, that plus worrying about the French. Get them both here tomorrow. Yes, Excellency. Uh, who, Excellency? The monk at the Grazia. The other letter writer. Leonardo. <coughs> Come on, hot or cold, what's the difference? <coughs> After you, Maestro. It doesn't hurt to be safe. You're a scientist. Think it'll help me? I wouldn't know, but it will help him because he'll be paid. <laughs> Why do all Tuscans have an evil tongue? Bill, go away. All right, come here. Now then, 
Nothing. The reason I have... <coughs> the main reason I sent for you, and this also includes you, this famous artist, I have decided, is going to decorate one of the refectory walls of your monastery. Something... most oh, something religious, of course. Last Supper, I think. Your refectory will have a fresco done by a famous painter. And you, you, maestro, will be able to eat again. I think you know the monks are wealthy. But we're not. Our treasury is... <laughs> if my treasury were as well stocked as yours is, I'd gladly pay. Oh, I would only ask you whether or not the painting necessarily has to be done in the refectory. Well, of course, the refectory. Where else? We eat there. So? I point out that Maestro Leonardo, who is a, a most excellent artist, he is a... Uh -huh. What you mean is he doesn't work very fast. Practice patience. While he's working, you can feed the monks in the kitchen. I'm not going to send you a man with a broom, you know, who'll push a lot of paint around, who'll finish a wall in a half an hour and leave a mess like that so-called mural of Montofano's. You've already got in the refectory. Uh, <coughs> and while you're there, I want you to have that ice all rubbed off. Every time I go to the monastery to fast, it turns my stomach just to be in the same room with it. Your food's bad enough already. Might I say only... <coughs> you have my permission to leave. Deo gracias. That's all. <coughs> well, you've got a job now. Why don't you look happy? <coughs> Marquisino! Uh, strange. How whenever my treasurer walks in, it brings a smile to everyone's face. Painters and monks alike. Listen, pay a hundred ducats in advance to my friend here. Uh, Leonardo. Yes, yes, Leonardo. The Last Supper. The subject had naturally been dealt with on several occasions by other artists. In 1493, the Duchy of Milan was ruled by Lodovico Sforza, the Moor. I regret that the very pressing necessity of having to earn my bread has forced me to delay the commissioned work, Your Excellency. Yes, yes, get on with it. Knowing Your Excellency's circumstances, I hesitated writing. Since it has been two years, however, since I last received any wages... Mm. Two years? Well, it can't be, can it? Uh, shall I continue reading? Yes, go on. Of the horse, Your Excellency commissioned, I will not even speak, knowing what the times are like. Brava. Much better to say nothing. Much better. What do these people expect of me anyway? I've rebuilt the Duomo, I've rebuilt the Grazia. I've rebuilt hundreds of canals so you can row all the way from the Tessino to the Adda. And if anyone should know the money it cost me to build those canals, he's the one. Didn't he invent those new doors? No matter what it costs, they've got to open out instead of opening it.